Hi, I'm Scott Eatingham. Thanks for joining us here in the Unique Northwest. Today we are joined by Tom Bonsi in Olympia. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. Pleasure to be with you. So, Tom, I got a question for you. Are you real ID compliant? And for that matter, everyone out there, are you real ID compliant? Because it's going to be important if you like to fly. Tom, what does that mean? That's a very good question, and I'm happy to say I am doubly compliant because I have a U.S. passport that's still good to fly, and I got an enhanced driver's license from the Washington State Department of Licensing. I and a lot of driver's licensing staffers and airport managers are worried about essentially a train wreck coming this fall at airports, to mix our metaphors, when travelers who weren't paying attention suddenly discover their ID is no longer acceptable at TSA security checkpoints. So October 1st is the 2020 is the deadline you need to pay attention. Take a look in your wallet. You might already have what you need as an alternative or your ID may, if you've got a driver's license lately, is good to go. You, you know, you could get uh, onto a plane with a U.S. or a foreign passport or a military ID card or a tribal photo ID or a permanent resident green card, just to name a few. But uh, you do need to check because uh, when I was looking into this earlier this week, the majority of driver's licenses in circulation in Oregon, Washington State, and Idaho are not of the uh, high security real ID compliant so-called licenses. So you mentioned those three states, of course, and they're not all the same. There's actually a little bit of nuance between residents in Washington, Idaho, and Oregon in terms of how the states are compliant. Can you just talk a little bit about some of those differences among the three states? Sure. What, so what happened at the beginning was that all of our Northwest states and others resisted what they considered to be a classic unfunded mandate, which when the federal government has a bright idea but doesn't give the states any money to carry it out. Over time, just about all the requirements to uh, have higher security licenses, verified documentation and so forth, to, you know, to really make sure that you are who your ID says you are, um, happened because they made sense for states and they, they did them when they were making an update to their systems anyway. A divergence, though, has happened between, say, Idaho and Washington State now in that Idaho decided to make all of its driver's licenses and ID cards, henceforth, real ID compliant. Washington State, by contrast, decided to go to a two-tier system. Oregon will do the same shortly, where you can get a cheaper uh, standard driver's license from the state. doesn't require proof of legal immigration status in Washington State's case, but it's not good for federal purposes like going through airport security or you can apply for a more expensive real ID compliant enhanced driver license in, in Washington state, which is now available and in Oregon will be available starting in July. Okay, so the message is hurry up and get that done so you're not caught off guard. No matter what state you live in, make sure that you got the right kind of ID to fly, or if you need to get a passport, time to start getting a passport application. All right, so let's talk about getting on the actual plane. And here is our segue. What if that plane isn't actually allowed to fly? So now we're going to talk a little bit about the Boeing 737 MAX and how long it is going to take to actually come back to service. Of course, Boeing big business in the Northwest, especially in Washington State. How long until Boeing 737 MAXs are actually back in the air? There was some surprising news on that front this week, Scott. Boeing announced the return for service for the 737 MAX probably won't happen until mid-summer. And this is just a few weeks after it had got given us an estimate of late February or March. What's happening is that regulators around the world keep finding new glitches in the aircraft design and software that need to be fixed, and it just takes longer. But I have to say personally, after this level of scrutiny, I'd be willing to board this airplane uh, without hesitation once it's cleared to fly again. So this grounding for as long as it's been going on has made for some interesting pictures and images. You've reported on some of it of planes kind of almost literally stacking up in, in storage areas, uh, both uh, on the west side and uh, in central Washington at the Moses Lake area or airport and elsewhere uh, across the U.S. So let's say realistically, um, if this Boeing 737 MAX never actually got back in the air because of whatever safety defect, and suddenly you have literally thousands of planes, right, that aren't able to fly. What does a company do with suddenly thousands of obsolete planes? No disrespect, I cannot see a scenario where that would happen. Uh, it, 
would uh, file it under too big to fail. There are hundreds of these airplanes now sitting at, on tarmacs in Moses Lake in the Seattle area, now in California, San Antonio. They will be fixed. There's too much at stake to do anything else. In the case of Moses Lake, it's really interesting, and it's a remarkable scene if you go by there. Uh, just a kaleidoscope of colors and kind of a Tetris game with these really big airliners to try and pack in, you know, in the case of Moses Lake, almost 250 brand new jets. And they all have to be kept in mint condition so that they are ready to fly again someday with their own generator and air conditioning system. Uh, the Moses Lake airport manager told me that there are probably 400 jobs now, uh, temporary long-term jobs at this rate, uh, connected with just keeping those airplanes with their new car smell. <laughs> well, we will certainly be anxiously awaiting the return to service whenever that does finally happen. Okay, speaking of things that fly, we hear a lot about drones. You do uh, various uh, kind of reporting on drone technologies and private and uh, government companies using them uh, for different purposes, uh, including in law enforcement. And the Washington State Patrol, it turns out, you've reported before and, and did some update this uh, recently about how many drones the Washington State Patrol actually uses. And it turns out it's quite a lot more than other law enforcement agencies and, and their counterparts in, say, Oregon and Idaho. First, uh, why is that and why are uh, is the Washington State Patrol even increasing the amount of drones it uses now. It's really a remarkable fleet. It's 130 kind of high-level consumer drones that are kept in, for the most part, in the trunks of uh, state troopers' vehicles around the state. They're used pretty much just for one purpose, which is to map a serious injury and fatality crashes. So there you can see the size of these. Um, you know, your, your kid under the Christmas tree maybe had a s smaller version of this. Chinese made drone. It has a camera on it. They fly it over an accident scene and very quickly can map what went wrong for future uh, investigation or filing of charges or, or court case. And in the past, they have to use a tape measure, completely shut down the road. Uh, there's also now a more modern kind of uh, surveyor tool that relies on laser beams. But, you know, putting up the drone in 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, you got a job done that used to take an hour and then traffic gets flowing again. Um, Washington State, for whatever reason, has been a leader on this and has far more drones in its fleet than any neighboring state. Oregon State Police, for example, has eight compared to the 130 that Washington State has. And just to be clear, you know, a skeptical or maybe a cynical person might think, okay, yeah, actually these are being used to spy on me or some sort of surveillance state you know, activity. Is that in any way what's going on? It is not, but that is definitely a concern of privacy advocates. And a lot of other police agencies have drones, including in the Northwest, and they use them for a broader range of purposes than, than just uh, crime scene mapping, uh, which is what the State Patrol pretty much limits them to. The State Patrol kind of didn't want to step in it, if you will, and cause controversy, so they are self-limiting themselves. Um, smaller agencies have had a lot of success, honestly, using drones with uh, search and rescue, for example, or uh, in dangerous uh, where, uh, SWAT situations where you have a person with a gun who's firing at uh, people coming too close, but you can put a drone up and, and see where, where they are actually uh, barricaded uh, in, in the scene. Uh, but um, for now, uh, keep it simple in the, is the idea of Washington State Patrol and just use it for this one uncontroversial thing of getting traffic moving faster after big crashes. Well, those are interesting stories. Thank you for coming on today and sharing them with us, Tom. My pleasure. You can see more of Tom's reporting on these and other stories at nwpb.org. Thank you for joining us here in the unique Northwest.